Thank you. No, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, first, it's a, a boy, it's so much fun to be here. It's a great honor to be here in Palo Alto and be with you guys here today. Um, we're going to start with a little warm up exercise. Okay, we know like in sports, everything, everybody has warm ups. As a cartoonist, as an artist, we also warm up before we start to. I hope you don't mind that I'm going to warm up a little bit here, but I'm also going to note the drawing pad and my, my uh, screen here where we're going to be showing lots of cartoons may not be absolutely ideally visible for those people over there. So I recommend you now get up, grab if there's a pad or a pencil near you, and come and move to this area here if you don't mind. Anybody here also, we're going to try to do our best so everybody can see, but it might be a little tricky. So anyways, I'm going to just... I want to warm up, and I like to warm up by doing caricatures. Caricature, to me, is a very exciting thing um, because, you know, when I, I was watching you guys during the cocktail hour, and I noticed that everybody here has got a face. <laughs> All right? And the thing about caricature is that as a caricaturist, you're seeing people's faces you're pulling them apart and reassembling them under your control. That you makes you quite a powerful person. And it's also an area of, of incredible fascination for me, different faces and what you can do with them. So I'm going to just start with doing Al Gore because, gosh, he's got a great face. I, the shape of his head is something that's, that can't be denied. Um, it's sort of something like this, OK? That's the shape of his head. And this is a good place to start. I warm up with his hair, which is very Ronald Reagan-esque which is kind of an odd thing. He's got ears like Spock from Star Trek. True, okay, they attach at the bottom. Go check it out, check them out, okay. He's got the long bony nose like this. He's got the flared nostrils like this, okay. And already you can start to see the Elvis lips coming in down here, this coming like, and already he's starting to appear on the paper and I'm feeling kind of good about myself, getting warmed up, but then it comes here, it comes to his eyes. Now we all know the eyes are the mirror to the soul. And when you're an artist really trying to capture somebody's eyes is one of the most important bits. And one thing you might remember back to 2000 and Al Gore lost that, that campaign by a few maybe dozen votes in Florida. And some people think that's what lost him the campaign. And I say no. He lost that campaign because Al Gore has got the eyes of death. He's got the eyes of death. Okay? That's why he lost the campaign, okay? Okay. All right, so I'm feeling good now. I'm feeling kind of warmed up here, okay? Feeling pretty warmed up. So I thought, as a warm-up for tonight's activity, there you go, okay, that I thought I would also allow you to get warmed up. And so what I wanted to do was actually take this opportunity to teach everybody here how to draw. Now you notice that there's pads and pens in the middle of the tables. I want everybody to grab them. And I want all of those, please, if you've got those turns, pass them to these guys back here. We're going to teach everybody here how to draw Barack Obama. OK? Now, one of the things I know some of you guys are saying right now, I cannot draw a straight line. No way. And I'm telling you, I can teach you how to draw. And in fact, the thing about drawing is a lot like humor. Everybody, everybody can be taught how to draw. There actually is like learning a foreign language, but this time expressing it through your hands. Now, just like any other foreign language, some of us have better propensity for learning languages than others. But I promise you, I give me enough time, I could teach you how to draw. Having said that, doesn't mean you're going to become an artist. Because becoming an artist is, is learning a foreign language but then being able to write poetry in that language. But today I'm going to teach you how to draw, and I have a little bit of a kind of a selfish reason for this. And that is, the cartoon world, the world that I inhabit and have been drawing for 30 some odd years, is a world that in some ways is kind of dying. Our, our craft, forged with humor and forged in the printed page, is now being challenged by the digital world. And so the cartoonist, this century-old art, is actually maybe in its kind of last breaths. And their cartoonists are losing their jobs rapidly. I feel I have this opportunity here to actually get 150 new cartoonists. Okay? So by the time you leave this room today, you will all 
be cartoonists. Right, so what we're going to do is first I'm going to do a very quick sketch of Barack Obama. Um, I'm going to do him from a profile just to give you some rough idea. Then I'm going to do it from the front quickly. Then we're going to do it together step by step, okay? Watch this. All right, so first, Barack Obama from a profile. Now, here's a guy whose face I've been watching for a long time. Um, his top of his head, kind of this kind of semicircular ball thing. The top of the hair kind of goes like this. Now, the profile is a good way to draw somebody because you get a kind of a line that you can actually draw from. Heavy brow, when the sun hits his, his forehead, you often don't even see his eyes because his brow is so heavy, and they're just kind of peeking out underneath there. The nose is not particularly you know, sensational. He does have a little mole right there, okay? He's got a very strong upper lip that's kind of good that comes down like this. This line here is getting stronger all the time, and already you can start to see, <laughs> right? He's starting to appear here, but here's the thing. Here's the thing that's kind of interesting. I've been watching him's face for a long time, as you know, and you also know that there's this kind of birther movement, right, that they don't think he was born in America. Well, I tell you, I'm looking at his face, and I'm beginning to think, you know, they might have something. Because if you look at his face, that sort of strong profile, I think maybe, maybe he wasn't born in Hawaii. Maybe he was born in Easter Island. <laughs> right? That's what I think. Possible. Isn't that true? Okay. All right, so, all right, so here's a quick front view. This is for you. Thank you. All right, so here's a quick front view, and then we're all going to do this together. All right, so the front view, again, these are very simplified. I've drawn this guy hundreds of times, but I will tell you that my own father, whose face is indelibly etched in my brain, I cannot draw from memory because I have not drawn him hundreds of times. So the process of actually doing it gives you resides in the special part of your brain. So in this case, Obama, I've distilled him quite simply. Again, what we're going to do is we're going to start with a semicircular kind of top like this. We're going to do a straight line across. That's his hair. Down the side. Don't, don't do it yet. Watch here, OK? Then we're going to do a line like this, a line like this. We're going to drop a line down like this, drop a line down like this. We're going to do a circle down here. We're going to do a set of parentheses here. We're going to do an M like this. We're going to fill in the top like this and again like this. Do a little bottom bit here, that little circle. This is the bottom of the nose here, the heavy brow, heavy brow. A little bit of lines here. We've got the ears like this, ears like this, okay, ears like this, like this. And then we've got the thin neck, ladies and gentlemen, Barack Obama, what do you think? Yes! So, can we do this? The, no, the answer is yes, we can. Can we do this? Yes, we can. All right, here we go. All right, get your paper. And I might need Chris as my lovely assistant to come and help. I'm going to draw, and then, then we're going to, he's going to hold the pad and go around and show, so you guys, everybody can see, see each stage, okay? So first, okay, I'll come, I'll draw, and then I'll let you take over. I'll come up here, okay? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do, everybody get your paper together, okay? We're going to do a shape just like this, okay? So let's just hold it like this, and then we're going to do that nice shape like that. All right, everybody got that? All right, good. All right, so the hair is going to be straight line across, vertical lines, and filled in like this, okay? Okay, can everybody see this? Very good, very good. All right, now we're going to do two little shelves down the side like this. Two little shelves down the side like this. Very good, children. Okay. <laughs> All right, then we're going to drop a line at an angle down like this, another line at an angle down like this. All right. Can you all see that? Okay. Well, at the bottom, we're going to do kind of a circular thing like this. Nice round chin that he's got it down at the bottom there. Okay, round chin. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do a set of parentheses right there. Set of parentheses around there. OK, cool. Then we're going to do the letter M, one up, down, and up like this inside the parentheses. OK, great. Let's fill that M in a little bit, just to make it a just a little bit more realistic, shall we? OK, fill in the top, fill in that M area, dark area. Put your pen, there we go. Lovely. Okay, we're going to do a shadow now. Shadow underneath the lip, and then we're going to connect the two parentheses at the bottom. Okay, so you have a shadow under the lip, 
and then beneath the parentheses, they'll be connected, okay? All right, now let's go up to those heavy brows we talked about before. The sun is gonna hit those, and so we're gonna put those at an angle, and you can really go to town on those if you write, like, okay? Kind of just like that. Okay, excellent. I want you to do now where the top of the parentheses are. We're just gonna do a little curly cue, which is going to be his nose, the shadow beneath his nose. Okay, cool. And then we can give them, you can actually give them little kind of slanted eyes underneath just like that, just to let them peek out from underneath the uh, heavy brows there. Just a couple more steps to go, a couple more steps. All right, now let's, where the, 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 uh, the, little, uh, the little flap is out there, let's put his ears peeking out like this. Okay, good, excellent. And then we give him the skinny neck, the skinny neck, okay. If you want, you can you know, give the rest of the body there and so on. And um, next step, two more steps to go, very important. The next step is I want everyone, please, to hold up their cartoons. Come on, let's hold up the cartoons, please. Let's have a look. Very good, all right, good, excellent. Good, thank you, oh wow, good job. Very good, all right, give yourself a round of applause, good, great, all right, now. Now the last thing you have to do is that you need to now sign those cartoons. <laughs> now remember, I've seen those cartoons. Do not sign my name to those cartoons. But, if you could take this, is that here's an important thing, is that you guys have all created something absolutely unique that has the same identity to you as your handwriting has to you. And that's one of the interesting things about drawing. It's also the interesting thing about humor. And what I want to say to you is I want to congratulate you because you are now members of the Cartoon Club. And as brothers and sisters of the cartoon community, I'm here to help coach you before you, you go out and face the world in a few hours' time. And so what I want to do is actually introduce you into some of the world and some of the tricks that we do as, as cartoonists and the, and the magic of the trade. Break, actually kind of peel away behind what goes into making a cartoon and make sure that you know how to use it and turn you into educated cartoon consumers in addition to being cartoonists yourself. Now I'm a professional guy who uses humor every day as a tool but also as a weapon. And humor can be a very powerful thing as I learned from my early days. And I, actually what I'm gonna do is gonna show you some slides here. Take you, take you through some cartoons. I thought it would be fun actually to start with some of my early work. <laughs> okay, now the thing is about cartoons, you know at age six everybody's drawing, right? Everybody's drawing, but somewhere between six and nine people drop off. And it's important though for, to note here is the caricature on the left of Abraham Lincoln is that children see things very simply, but children also have a kind of a playful approach to life. And when you're a professional humorist, you have to find a way to be playful with those parts of the world today, even some of the most serious things in the world. So I started my career in the realm of caricature. You know, I started uh, in, in Great Britain uh, doing people like Margaret Thatcher at the time, and then also characters like this, okay? <laughs> right, Ronald Reagan there on the right. Who's the guy on the left, anybody? Gorbachev. Gorbachev, very good. Who said that first, anybody? Okay, 10 points for Gryffindor, there you go, okay. All right, so um, we've got you know, characters. The thing about caricature, I remember a, uh, a good um, English caricature said to me, you know you're doing a good caricature of somebody when they start to stare back at you from the page. <laughs> and you know you're doing a great one when they wink at you from the page, okay? So um, over time, I have drawn over 6,000 published cartoons, and 140 covers for different magazines. So, so what I've learned is that caricature is a wonderful way, it's a very powerful way to bring the powerful down to the level of the common man. I've also found that caricature and political cartoons play a very special role in society because they are little kind of frozen nuggets of history 
They tell a story much better than any given photograph does of what was going on in the period of time. It's the reason why you see cartoons in history books, why you see them in encyclopedias, and now you even see them in standardized, te standardized tests at, um, in, in high schools where people are learning uh, about history. And sometimes a, a cartoon image can be so powerful. This cartoon, for example, ran on the cover of The Economist without a single um, uh, title to it. It just told the story of what America was like after Katrina, where the country was being blown away, but also um, uh, George Bush's presidency was under siege as well. So what I want to do in my world of cartoons and you guys is I want to give you seven major tools that we use as editorial cartoonists in our world. The first one and the most important one I think is caricature because caricature is the most compelling thing, actually the, I think the most potent tool at the hands of a satirist because here you have this opportunity to take the powerful and knock them down a notch, but it's also because we all are so conditioned to looking at faces that allows us to be able to reside in a very special part when you do some, something with a, a powerful person's face. And during elections is actually the time when, when caricaturists take primary, when you know we cartoonists are, are our most powerful because we're helping the audiences understand what faces are supposed to be like and who the politicians are through the expression. Now look at Barack Obama here. This is what's interesting is here, this is what he looked like during the election, correct? He was so optimistic. He had this thousand watt smile that, you know, there's no color in nature of, of, his, of his teeth there. And he, was, he looked so relaxed and everything, but look, look what he looks like now, two years later. This is what he looks like, <laughs> right? He's got the weight of the nation on his face, okay? And so, um, in fact, as a cartoonist, I kind of, ca ca I kind of catalog this. This is a, a many-part cartoon here. Um, this is what he looked like when he came into office, Barack Obama. After the first 100 days, he started to look like this. 200 days, 500 days, 1,000 days, and now this is what it looks like for 2012 as, as he's running for re-election. So, so, um, <laughs> So now, here we are, cartoonists. Now, some, one of the things that we, we need to use in our cartoons as we move forward, we have to realize that we have kind of two major um, opportunities uh, and, 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 and things we need to harness, and that's pictures and words. And in our cartoons, we have some cartoons that are driven by pictures and some cartoons that are driven by words. So we have sight gags and we have word gags. And actually, the best cartoons, I think, are ones where those two are so intertwined that they can't live without each other. But we do change our emphasis from the day to day. So for example, this is a great example of a sight gag. Um, here's another sight gag, uh, just say no to birth control. <laughs> All right? Where the picture, the picture is carrying the story. Now, the, the other, another tool that we use is symbols. Um, I say it's our visual shorthand, it's our language, okay? It's our nomenclature. So we have symbols like the elephant from the Republicans and the donkey from the Democrats. We use Uncle Sam. We have all these other things, partly because we want, we have, a, we maybe have 10 seconds of the busy days of our clients and be able to get our point across. The more, the more shorthand that we use, the better chance that we're going to stay with them and they're going to give us time. Another tool that we use, this is also, of course, you can see here, we're using the two characters, the uh, two symbols. But there's another tool at play here. It's what I call the visual pun. We all know that a pun, when it comes to language, is all about taking a word that has two meanings. A visual pun is where you have a single image that also has two different meanings. So in this case, we have an, a donkey, uh, the Republicans, um, trunk is also a finger. And you'll see this used over and over again in cartoons. So here's an example cartoon that uses our friend, Uncle Sam, okay, another one of our symbols. But this cartoon is driven by words. Okay, this, this is going to be a verbal gag. Let me, let me read it out for you. So here he is, it's Uncle Sam. He's talking to the people of Cuba, and he's saying, people of Cuba, why stick with that dictator idiot Castro when you can freely elect your idiots like we do? Okay, and this, um, this all took place during the time of Monica Lewinsky and all that stuff. So I was down and visiting Cuba in 1999, um, came back and I did this cartoon, and I'm going to tell you a little story about my visit to Cuba a little bit later. 
So here again, another verbal cue starring our friend Uncle Sam. What foreign enemies think Americans are looking for, world control. What Americans are really looking for is remote control. <laughs> okay? So notice here the notion of important character and words driving the story. Now I want to the, another important thing for us cartoonists need to know about, and that is composition and timing. Now these two things are related for us in the cartoon world because as you know when jokes are being told it's all about timing. If I had a joke and I handed it out to five people at random in this room, chances are one or maybe two of them would be able to make that joke work and three of them would slaughter the joke, right? It's just the way it is. Delivery is really important. Well in the cartoon delivery is important but what I have to do is I have to manage your eyeballs so that when you reside on the cartoon, you read the cartoon in a certain pattern so that I don't give away the joke too early. Okay, here's an example. See this cartoon right now? It's saying, attention passengers, expect delays due to holiday traffic. And this is the total cartoon here. Okay, so the idea is, the delivery of the cartoon is you read up here first, and in the west we read left to right, on the east, they actually do their, their gags the other way because they read the opposite direction. So the gag starts up here, you lead the eyes down like this, and then you reside down here and you finish the punchline. But there's also something else about this that we cartoonists know when we're dealing with people is you don't want to give too much away. You want people to work a little bit for the joke. Why? Because it's like a puzzle. People like puzzles because when they get the puzzle, their harm comes around and they pat themselves on the back. I am so clever, I got that cartoon. You know, I am, so, I am such the man. So that's what you want to do is actually make people feel rewarded for their work that they do. Now this is an example of timing in a single panel. Um, but it's also sometimes we do cartoons where we do it over multiple panels. But in addition, we have this other thing called dark humor. So we have silly humor, the last cartoon was silly humor. We also have cartoons that have dark humor, where things actually aren't that funny, but this cartoon also employs the visual pun. As you can see where the smokestacks and the candles are the same thing. Now when Dick Cheney... <laughs> Another example of dark humor. But what was so interesting about this, and it deals with topical humor, is I did not have to tell you what this story was about. Because you all culturally knew and understood it, and by getting it meant that you knew that everyone collectively got it, you also congratulating yourself for your knowledge and understanding of what's going on in the world. And that's another thing for the cartoonists want to do is, is kind of assume it's great to reward your audience by letting them know that they, they're really smart. Now there's sometimes a single panel is not enough, and we have to tell our story, our jokes, over many panels, like a comic strip, okay? Here's a great example of one, okay? Here it's up, up in heaven, you can see, hello, Lord Almighty's office, Michael the Archangel speaking, may I help you? Voice from off stage, who is it? It's Pope John Paul II on the line, again? He's worried about this movement to ordain women as priests. But I've already told him what I think. Tell him I'm busy. I'm sorry, she's busy right now. <laughs> okay? So here's a cartoon that you really couldn't have told in one panel. In fact, but here's a bit about timing. Notice the whole thing about humor and gags is, is what I call the bait and switch, where you lead people along a certain path and then you leave the joke for the last sentence. And up to that last sentence, you want to make it so they have no idea where this is going. And then you deliver it under your control. And again, it's, that con it's the incongruity that catches them and, the and ignites the laughter. This is one of my favorite cartoons that tells a story over four panels. But this cartoon, in contrast to the previous one, the other one was driven by words, correct? This one is driven by pictures, not any words in it, really. This cartoon actually tells four, this in four panels what happened in eight years in Iraq. The whole story of Iraq, okay, in eight years. So the first panel is this is where we were at the start. Uncle Sam, one of our symbols, sees WMDs. He says, I'm going in, I'm going to find him, I'm going to get him. Uh-oh. 
where'd they go? They were here a minute ago. Uh oh, it's worse than I thought. Oh, there they are. There they are. Yep, that's the story. So again, over four panels. So this cartoon is actually one of my favorite cartoons. Um, it's actually also most of my most reproduced cartoons. And this cartoon employs another one of our cartoon tricks that we all need to know and understand. And that is calligraphy, lettering. Because actually calligraphy and lettering in cartoons is our tone of voice. What I love actually about cartoons is that they're completely interactive. When you read them, you actually give the tone of voice. You create the sound effects in your own head. The cartoonist just throws these things out here. And heck, these don't look like real people, but we project reality onto these characters. So notice the different type of words here. So the cartoon says, it's about the stock market, just a normal day at the nation's most important financial institution. A guy there says, I've got a stock here that could really excel. Really excel, excel, sell, 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 sell. This is madness I can't take anymore. Goodbye, 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 bye, 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 bye. I've got a stock here that could really excel. So note, several things that we talked about before. We have it done over time, like several panels. We're also using different lettering to give kind of a different tone of voice. But it's also interesting to me that we're dealing with a subject that's quite complicated, finance. We're in this cartoon business, and one of the things we need to try to do in our cartoon business is try to explain those things in the world that are complicated distilled down to black and white. The world is gray. We're making it black and white. And in the process of simplifying, in fact, we're actually discarding a lot of the important stuff, and actually every cartoon we do is ultimately unfair in what we do. But we're willing to do it because we're doing it for an important reason, and that is even though we're dealing with humor as cartoonists, our job is not to make people laugh. Our job is to make people think, using humor, using it as a vehicle for message. And in fact, I'd like to quote one of my favorite um, 19th century British philosophers, Mary Poppins, who said, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. And the thing about humor is that humor allows your brain to kind of open up particularly for those who have prejudices, or, or everyone does actually have their own notions of what the world is like, and they see the world through, through a certain prism. But if people are anticipating a laugh, when they look at a cartoon, they're anticipating a laugh, they're gonna give it a go, and they can be often surprised at the things that they laugh at and reassess the world using humor. So this is the um, last cartoon of the series of the seven important things um, is a cartoon I bring in because it has lots of different elements in it that we talked about before. But this also uses one of the styles of humor, the many styles of humor, irony. There are others, overstatement, understatement, the bait and switch I talked about before, another one I call the marriage of convenience. These are all different types and styles of humor, which if you're gonna be a successful cartoonist, you want to try to manage and master all these because as a cartoonist, we do, well, I've published 6,000 cartoons. And all those cartoons, each one is only a sentence. A group of cartoons that you do in a week is a paragraph. And over the course of your career, you're actually kind of creating books and volumes of communication with audiences. And the idea when you do a cartoon, in order to be an effective communicator with humor, you want to vary it up every day. You want to be unpredictable. Then, because if stuff is predictable, that's no longer funny. And you want to be able to keep a conversation going, just like you do when you have with your friends and your loved ones, is that you want to make sure that you keep things moving and fun. If you speak monotone all the time, you're going to lose people. So as a cartoonist, we want to master all these various different tools and harness them and display them regularly in different ways. In this cartoon, notice, we have lettering. But know how the balloon is made small in order to make the feeling that that guy is really far away. Okay, we have um, design, composition. Your eyes go to where those two headlights are. They sh shift up here, the heat here, and then here, and then they drop down here. Bang, payoff. And then you see a character, not an Uncle Sam, but an Arab character being utilized in the cartoon. Again, all these different tools used in a single cartoon. All right, but now, now, we're cartoonists. I told you we have 150 new cartoonists here. But guys, guess what? The job market's not looking too good out there. 
telling you, it's not looking too good. But there are new opportunities. New opportunities in the moving image. Animation. That's where the future of satire is. In fact, since mankind was able to first scribble something on the cave walls, we found ways to use pictures in a way of satire. So I've actually been, been pursuing this a bit myself. I have my own animation company. Actually, I'm lucky because back when I was at university, actually, my senior thesis was a 13-minute long animated cartoon. And you know I, I told you how great caricature is. I thought, hey, new technology, how can I make caricature come alive in 3D? Can we do this? So a couple of years ago I did, I built a few uh, 3D characters. We did Hillary Clinton, and we did George Bush, and we did John McCain. <laughs> and we had a show. I did actually toured with Second City, you know, the improv comedy troupe. And as part of it, we did a live, interactive animation where we built characters like this. And then backstage, I would be wearing a motion capture suit where I would be dressed in this outfit and my I would be rigged to this character. So as I moved, John McCain would move and George Bush would move. And we would have live press conferences with audiences where they could actually interact with the characters. It was really great. And so as part of it, at the end, we actually had a thing where we had a debate, a live debate between Barack Obama and John McCain, okay? And I would ask them questions. In fact, I'm not going to ask a question right now. You remember back to the time that Senator McCain, uh, when you were running Senator, you had Sarah Palin as your candidate. Do you think she's qualified to be president? Listen, my friends, Sarah Palin is qualified to be president. She has ridden caribou to hunt polar bears with bazookas. She has caught Chinook salmon blindfolded with her teeth. No community organizer in Chicago has ever done that, right? Oh boy, now that was pretty bad. Now Senator Obama, were well, you gonna have any response to that? What do you think about Sarah Palin? Do you think she's qualified to be president? That is a very good question, but first, I need to say this. Now look out, here comes the we spin. We must keep this election civil. Sure. When it is over, whatever the result, I promise to reach across the aisle yada, yada, to yada. extend my hand and personally throttle Senator McCain. You are so lame. America, we must keep the audacity oh, there's that of old hope alive. Again. Yeah, I'm against torture, Senator, but for you I might make an exception. I am the man. You're not the man. I am down you with You are it. not down. Look, Senator, you're, you're, I will not attack your character. Sure. I have great respect for your blah, service blah, to blah, America blah. in the uh -huh. War of 1812. Why, you little punk. At least we didn't pull out of that war. Bring it on. I'll bring it on. You want, you want a this? piece of this, old I, man? I do. I want some right Step now. Step on over here and taste the audacity of my fist. I'm sure it tastes like chicken. <laughs> All right, let's give it up for John McCain and Senator McCain. Let's go. Awesome. Awesome. All right, so, so we know that we've got now these tools, the various tools that we need to master. We also know that now that we need to try to get uh, up with the new technology and be able to better harness and, and spread our, our, um, our satire around the world. So I just want to leave you guys with, with a couple of thoughts. Um, the first is my trip to Cuba. So when I was down there, I actually met with a, a whole collection of cartoonists. I've had the good fortune of representing the United States in many international meetings and met cartoonists from around the world. And one cartoonist said something to me that stuck with me. He says, here in Cuba, it's very hard to be a cartoonist because you have to think before you laugh. You have to worry about who may be hearing you laugh at certain jokes. The government runs everything from the schools and every job. And that if you laugh at an inopportune joke, you have the opportunity of losing your job or your family losing their job or other opportunities. Something so human and personal as laughter can be controlled by a government. Now, I also, uh, for time, for three years, was president of an international human rights group dedicated to cartoonists. And it seems silly, but in over two-thirds of the world, we could not even have this meeting. Okay? The police would march in, you guys be arrested, I'd disappear never to be seen again. And our crime, laughing at our own head of state. So I think that um, as I send you out to this world of the cartoons as cartoonists, armed with caricatures of your own head of state, I can also think that you don't have anything to fear because we're so lucky we live in a society where we can do that. So I'd encourage you to draw more, just like you were when you're six years old, and laugh as much as possible. Thank you very much. 